Today on Real Ghost Stories Online, was it an earthquake that struck a single home or was it the dead coming back and shaking a home to its foundation? Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. That it is. 855-853-4802 is our phone number at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost stories with us. We'd absolutely love to hear them. Of course, you can also uh, write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. And if you really like the show, you want to help keep us on the air, well, we would love that too because it's what fuels this program, your support. When you become an EPP, an extra podcast person, you sign up to do that at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash Stories. Both places, same content, different platforms. But to get all of our bonus episodes, all of our advanced episodes, the archive, and it's all commercial free too. So if you, you want a feed of the show there that uh, you don't have to uh, have the ads, and that's a way to go. And you get, of course, get the EPP bonus episodes every single week, the whole archive of them, our ebook, our audiobook, lots and lots of stuff that you guys get when you support the program at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Maybe make it a gift to yourself here in this new year. Or Valentine's Day is not far away. So maybe your Valentine who loves ghosts, they would appreciate that too. It's uh, Carol Hughes and myself, uh, Tony, with you today. How are you this fine day? Hey, Tony, I'm um, interested in this earthquake story. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm wondering what that's like. I've heard stories like that before where a haunted home is almost under siege by weather or earthquake or things of that nature. And then they get out of their home uh, and discover, wait a second, it wasn't hailing that night uh, or there wasn't an earthquake that day. Uh, and it wasn't fault. The rocks weren't falling that night either. I've heard the rock one, too. And that's a real scary concept of boulders or not boulders, but like pebbles and stuff falling from the sky. And you wake up and your lawn's filled with them. Um, oh, yeah. Just that's a F. <laughs> that's a th- I mean, that's-, that's a thing that has happened in, in some cases a very kind of dark, demonic type stuff. Um, I know like the Amityville case, they had their claims were that they, they thought there was these thunderstorms that were going on on specific nights and forecasts show, no, those nights there was no storms. Um, so, you know, then you can, the argument would be, well, are they making it up or was this what they just experienced? And other stories would lead you to point to many have experienced similar phenomena in similar type cases. So, well, you know, in my town, we, I live in South Central Kansas, mm-hmm. and we've been having a problem with earthquakes. Yeah, you have. And they're not like massive earthquakes, but I could also see now, it because I've talked about that one years ago that happened when I thought like a car had gone through my wall yes. in my house. Yeah. But now I actually think that probably was an earthquake. And if yeah. I'd have had a device in my hand where I could have just looked up earthquakes near me, I might have been able to discover it because back then it was harder to find out. You had to turn on the computer and, oh wait, was that, that was, when was this? When, that would have been, let me think, probably early 90s, late 80s. Okay, yeah. So yeah, yeah, I might not, I wouldn't have had a no, computer. No, you're right. I, I was thinking it was more recent. They were back then. I was thinking it was more recent than that, but yeah, you're exactly that right. That happened years ago. And, but the earthquakes here recently, you know, it's like it, it, it is a very strange sensation when you're not used to having them. Sure. And we had seven in one day recently. That's, yeah. I, that's the only place I've ever experienced an earthquake in my life was in Wichita. I was at a, a pizza restaurant and we're sitting there and all of a sudden it's like, you feel that? And... I look outside and the vehicles are rocking and it's like, Oh my God, it's an earthquake. And that's the only time I've ever felt an earthquake, <laughs> but it was a good one. <laughs> well, and the weird thing, it ha- when it happened at work one day, um, cause I work at the food bank mm-hmm. and we have a really large warehouse. We service 85 counties. Mm-hmm. And so we have a very large warehouse with a lot of 
pallets of food up really high. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it rattled that entire building. Like our building's probably, I don't know. It's huge. I don't know how many. Yeah. Let's just say it's huge. But it rattled that whole building and it sounded like something massive fell in the warehouse. And then I'm like, was that something we should be running out of here over? Or was that an earthquake or what the hell was it? Yeah. So it is very disorienting when it happens. Oh, and especially a warehouse setting too. I mean, that's just like, yeah, run for cover that you don't want to be in a Costco or a Sam's club or anything like that when that shit's going down. No. And I just feel bad for anybody who, you know, lives anywhere where you really get rocked by that stuff. Well, the scary thing so I'm is... I'm kind of intrigued by this story. Yeah, I, I am too. Let's jump into that. It uh, starts out, it says, we've always had haunted homes. I think ghosts just are attracted to my family. The house I mainly grew up in was beautiful, but not so busy with unexplainable events. My uncle had owned the house. My dad bought the house later after he died. We would see my uncle in the hall or cooking in the kitchen. We had a pool in the backyard that had been filled in later at the time we lived there. Even after it was filled in, you could still hear the splashing of water. The basement was the worst. There must be some rule that basements must be creepy. But my brother had his bedroom in a sectioned off part of the basement with curtains. He worked the third shift. It'd be about 3 or 4 a.m. when he would go uh, home. He said one day he was cleaning up in the bathroom downstairs and heard a human, not radio, a man singing hymns. The only radio station that played clearly downstairs was the Christian station. I was in the laundry room one time and home alone. The laundry room was all the way in the very back of this long basement and you had to go past my brother's room to get to it. While doing laundry, I hear a crash like in the wall of boxes being stored. They'd fallen off the wall in this room. So I hurry up, run towards the stairs, peeking at his room. and Nothing's out of place. I left my house and went to work an hour early just so I did not have to be home alone. When I was 18, I met my husband and he moved in with my family and we were experiencing triplet boys. He was once smacked in the back of the head while sitting in our den. He seen the wall shake so hard the pictures wobble like there was an earthquake, but nothing else moved. He'd hear footsteps over the baby monitor in the boys' room and once they were born, when no one was there. My parents' room was one room past the boys and one night my parents had gone out of town. My mom always played the radio on low volume at night on an easy listening type of music station. This night, we had settled the boys into bed and were in our room, and the radio starts blaring across the house. It was Christian music again. So my husband braved it and turned it off. We brought the boys to our room for the rest of the night. And the day my parents were due back from their trip, all this noise was coming from their empty room. It sounded like stomping and bumping. So I told the noise, Hey, can you stop making so much noise because everyone will be home today? Immediately, the noise was stopped. When the boys were three... Our house was being built, and when it was completed, we could move into it. Around three months prior to moving, many times a little girl ghost would knock our bedroom door open. It would physically hit the wall, and she would run in around the room and out again. The first time, we thought it was one of the boys, but quickly we realized it was something we could not see. It did not matter what time of day it was. You could have something happen. One day, when the boys were napping, I watched the door to the coat closet open and shut multiple times. I loved and hated that house. You could give me a million dollars and it would not, I would not live there again. The property we live on now has a soldier that used to say hello now and then or impersonate our voices, but they stay outside. So I'm good with that. There you go. That's what's up with the earthquake like things going on in the house. You know, those people, it doesn't matter. That Mm -hmm. shit's going to happen. Yeah. Like, I do think there's something to that. Like, why everywhere they go does something like that happen? I would imagine there's a sensitivity there or there's something that is following them, an attachment of some sort. I mean, it seems kind of dark. And, Little girl and, and then like, oh, was it a soldier or something? Soldier is what it appeared, at, appeared to be at the, the next house. Now, whether that's from that house, I don't know. Uh, but I wonder if it's just something where they're almost beacons for these things and they just, yeah, I don't know. Some families seem to kind of have that. Um, but it's one thing where you're just sensitive to it. It's another where it's, it's like literally rattling the walls. That's, that's very interesting because that, that just shows us something very powerful that's following them around. You know, and it's interesting for someone like that who has had experiences in the current house mm-hmm. to say, 
I wouldn't take a million dollars to move back into that house. Yeah. Like that's kind of saying something. This is someone who is used to that stuff. Yeah. That uh, no, it, it makes sense. I mean, once you've had the, the trauma, you know, it's like, I'm good. Uh, nothing's going to, it's not worth it. Thank you for your story. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. I have a story to share after this next uh, story. We had a bird in the house over the holidays. Quite literally, it was kind of Clark Griswoldish. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, first, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, there's the tease. I'll start out with, hi, you guys. Recently discovered you, and I found my tribe. I'm writing to you from the Olympic Peninsula of the Pacific Northwest in Washington State. Quick background on me. I've been sensitive to the other side my whole entire life. Sensitive is an understatement. I see them. I hear them. I know about them all the time. I have many, many stories and look forward to sharing them with you. I want to start with something that happened to the town that I currently live in, Port Townsend, Washington. In our area, we have three old forts that were established in the mid-1800s. They're all part of the Parks Department now, but have retained most of the barracks, houses, and munitions buildings. They also have lots of hiking trails. When I moved here eight years ago, I was delighted to discover that I lived one mile from old Fort Townsend and looked forward to lots of walks in the woods there. The trails all have names. Terillium Trail, Road Trail, and even Cemetery Trail. More about that later. Fort Townsend was built in 1856, but was destroyed by fire 40 years later. It has a creepy vibe. When I first started walking the trails, I always had that feeling of being watched. The woods are thick and dark. The cougars have been spotted in the area, so I thought I was maybe hypervigilant. Silly me. Shortly after I, after I discovered the trails, I got a puppy. And I look forward to having him as a walking buddy on all the trails. One afternoon, I was walking my puppy, and I noticed a man walking a few hundred feet ahead of us on the trail. He was walking slowly, seemed to have difficulty walking, and had a limp. He was wearing what looked like an old army jacket or something similar. After a few minutes, I realized that we were moving much faster than he was and would soon need to pass him. When we got about 15 to 20 feet behind him, I cleared my throat and started to let him know that we were behind him. I said, hello, excuse me, and right before I could finish, right behind you, can we get by you? He made an abrupt turn to the left, which was great, except when I got to the place where he turned, there was no trail. Not only that, but there was no path, not even an animal path, not even a break in the very thick brush and trees, not a leaf or branch was moving. I stopped in my tracks and I saw him turn into the woods right there. I immediately broke out about in full body goosebumps. I picked up my puppy, turned around and ran the mile back to the trailhead, looking back over my shoulder several times. At the time, Walking Dead was extremely popular, and I thought, did I actually just see a whole entire real zombie? And then have I lost my damn mind? I told my husband about it, who, of course, was convinced that I just misjudged the turn in the trail. I took him out there and showed him exactly where it was. He knows me well enough to know that I'm very savvy in the woods and would have known my trail markers, especially since I was out there by myself. So he, so he believed me, but couldn't come up with an explanation for what happened. He's used to my sensitivity, so he's used to not being able to come up with explanations. After a few weeks, I started back to walking the trails, but I could never shake that experience. And whenever I passed that part of the trail, I'd make sure and look for a hidden path or any trace of a path. The feeling of being watched never went away. A few years ago, I noticed that the park had refreshed the trail signs. As I was taking the cemetery trail, I noticed that there was a post at the beginning of the trail with a brochure. I read that they were not exactly sure where the cemetery site was, but the post was in the general area. There had been several soldiers that had been buried there, but had been exhumed and reburied in a military cemetery, either Oregon or San Francisco. I can't find the brochure and do not remember. However, one of the soldiers either was exhumed or, and reburied, but did not get registered at the new cemetery, or he was not exhumed at all and is still buried there. Boom. I 100% believe that the man I saw on this trail was the missing soldier. I still walk the trails, and whenever I walk the cemetery trail, I always acknowledge him. Hello, I saw you today. I hope you're all right. I've not seen him since, but I still feel watched. I've never approached the rangers and asked about him, but someday I just might. I've talked to other people who walk the trails, and most agree it's a creepy place. Poor Townsend has a lot of interesting and awful history. For example, men used to regularly get uh, sh uh, uh, shanghaied when ships needed a crew. One of the restaurants in town has a history of prisoners being kept in the basement until they could be loaded into the ship to force to work at sea. A walk through town always brings a paranormal activity of some sort for me. The two forts have officers' quarters that you can rent out. 
I've done it twice for family gatherings and both times have experienced undeniable paranormal activity like doors opening and the feeling of someone sitting on a bed while sleeping. A few years ago, someone caught an entity on video at one of the other forts, Fort Warden. I believe it may still be on YouTube. This is just one story from my time so far in Port Townsend. I look forward to sharing more. I love listening to your show. I feel less alone. Thank you and keep up the good, creepy work. There you go. There's some interesting things going on in that port town. You know, that's something I can totally relate to. Now, my dog is 15, so needless to say, we don't do tons of hiking these days. Um, but we have. I can't even tell you how many miles we've spent on trail. Hours and hours and miles and miles doing trails. And I totally, as you're reading that, I could see it, you know. And like, there are when you're on a trail and you see someone number one it's always a little weird because yeah. you don't normally encounter people mm-hmm. or sometimes you do but it's always you notice them. yeah because frequently when you're on a trail it's not like you see tons of other people if you're far enough away and then the other thing is nobody's walking around where there's not a trail because you can't yeah you know there's too much too much stuff grow and you can't walk through that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I have had creepy feelings before, but only like once or twice. And it was one of them was on a civil war battleground. Well, duh. Yeah. And, but I could totally connect to that story. Like, and, it, and another thing you would notice a guy on a trail who's limping because it's like, whoa, did he fall down and get hurt? Or why is he limping? And, yeah. you know, he should be way back there because he's limping and he shouldn't have gotten this far. That was interesting. I, I've never thought about seeing somebody on a trail when I'm just out walking my dog. Well, now you have something to get freaked out about for your next walk. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God my dog's 15 and he only goes to the end of the street these days. On uh, on Christmas day i think it was we uh we went and walked uh, over at the uh the the haunted trail we have here in prairie grove uh where some uh, three thousand some people died uh in the battle there during the civil war and it's just it's just such a weird thing you know you're walking around this park and it's like you know about as many people who died on 9 11 died right here in this park uh like probably within a like a battle yeah, right it was yeah it was in a confined space in a battle and so that was in over maybe a day or two hour yeah. period. Or yeah. Or 24 hour yeah, period. It was not long. And it's just, you know, now it's this pretty, you know, park and kids go sledding there. And it's just, it's, I, but I find it very peaceful walking around there. I don't get a weird vibe. I get, I get kind of, I don't know. I'm not super sensitive though, either, but it doesn't feel threatening to me. It just kind of feels like peace. I don't know. I don't know why that would in a war site, you know, it, it, it's, but it does. Uh, speaking of some strange things, that all, also on the, on Christmas Day, uh, all of a sudden, uh, Libby came down the stairs and was like, oh my God, Dad, there's a bird in the house. They're hard to get out. And I'm like, huh? Because it was a really cold day, so nobody was like keeping the doors open or anything. I have no idea how it got in. All of a sudden, it's like we hadn't been going in and out for a long time, and all of a sudden, we just spot this bird. And then when it's spotted, then it starts kind of flying all around. And I grab a uh, a net, uh, a crabbing net that I had bought a couple of years ago when well, we were that was in the handy. Gulf. Yeah, and I'm not, I don't want to hurt the bird. I just want to, you know, get him and get him back out to safety before he, you know, runs into something and hurts himself. And going back and forth downstairs for a bit, and you know, into the kitchen, into this. Luckily, I didn't break anything. Nor did the bird. And then it discovers, oh, there's an upstairs. So it gets upstairs. No. But. It, Upstairs is better because the goal is to get it into a confined space and the downstairs is pretty open concept. So it gets upstairs. I'm like, okay, let's at least keep it up here. And then it gets into one of the, it gets into Harp's room. So I get in there and shut the door and it's like just sitting on her bed (laughs) and like, hi birdie. And then it just takes off and then boom, 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 back all around the room but i get it uh shortly thereafter and uh and i i let it go safely outside and and it was all good but uh it was kind of really hard to catch well when you're in a smaller room it's not bad 
Um, yeah. Bigger spaces, yes. That's why I probably didn't get it downstairs. But it kind of freaked me out because I was like, I don't know how this bird even showed up here or how it even got in. And I'm like, what the hell is this? It's not like you just leave your doors wide open. I mean, maybe if you were moving or something like that. No, but I just, I don't know. I do not know how it got in without anybody noticing it. And there was some freaky, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you off the air what some things were going through my mind at that moment. But um. <laughs> <laughs> I had one in my house once and I, like I'm running late for work. And then I look up and saw it. I'm like, of course. Yeah. Of course. And you can't like. You're fine. You know, yeah. like, I don't want the bird in my house all day. Yeah. So, so I open the door thinking maybe if I can just kind of corral it, mm -hmm. the door. But of course, it flies into the living room. So I'm like, oh, damn. So I turn around and to open that door thinking, okay. And it just flew out. It's like, oh my God, thank you. Like, all right, I'm good. Thanks for the show. It's probably like, my God, I thought I was going to have to live here forever. <laughs> <laughs> but that was uh, that was the excitement, uh, I guess, of that. We went and visited a place where thousands of people perished, and a bird got in the house. Merry well, fucking you know, Christmas. Christmas, twenty twenty, Tony. Exactly. It was it was a Christmas. It was the uh, yeah. It was one of the worst. Uh, so good times for all. I spent I spent it looking at my dog who had just had a procedure done. <laughs> oh, then I had the first panic attack in my life too. So that was fun. Um, so I, and I know I Christmas, write all that in your journal. Yeah. I never had your one journal. ever in my life. And that was the, the night I got 2020 it. Fashion. It was just, and it was random. Like it was like, I could not really pinpoint what had triggered this, but all of a sudden I just gasped for air and I was like, what the hell? And I'm thinking I'm having a heart attack or something and my mouth goes dry and I'm feeling kind of uh, numbish around my body, but it wasn't like left side or right side or heart pains or anything like that but then i learned more about what it was and I'm like oh okay that makes sense um so merry christmas everybody or, or, or it's actually it's 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 the beginning of february now so but uh that was how that went we're recording this at the end of uh very yeah, end of december like new year's eve is on thursday yeah so we're we're right entering the new year no, i can't wait that's gonna be so exciting <laughs> it's just a fucking it's number like, change awesome. 2021 and guess what same shit different day <laughs> i'm gonna go to bed now yay all right yeah good times let's do uh let's do another caller here before we wrap things up on the episode hi it's so fun to call in okay so <clears throat> my name's dotty we'll start there um i wanted to share my story it's all about dreams and this one is kind of, I thought it was really sweet, so I'm going to share it. Quick backstory. When I was 13, I would um, grab this book that my sister had, and it was all about dreams and dream interpretations. And the last few chapters were actually about lucid dreaming and how to do it, which I thought was really interesting. Like, it's all about how to control your dreams and... I actually started to learn a li uh, quite a bit about it and have these really amazing experiences. I haven't done it for a really long time. and just kind of stopped, but um, you can have really vivid dreams um, and have some very cathartic experiences. It's, it's absolutely cool. So um, I'll do a quick fast forward to when I was 21. Still kind of doing the lucid dream thing, not so much, but I was visiting my parents, and so was my sister, so the whole family under one roof, yay. Um, and uh, I had this dream. So the dream was I was at my grandparents' house, and my grandparents had this cute little cottage on, on the uh, lakefront and about 140 acres of farmland. So it was quite, quite something. So my dream, I was all by myself at my grandparents' house and I was on this little raft that they had floating in the lake and I was just letting the waves bring me in just very, you know, ever so gradually. And they kind of like, you know, but I also started noticing the waves were getting a little bit bigger for a lake and thought that was kind of interesting. So I let the waves bring me to shore and I get up 
And I just start walking along the shoreline. Like I said, it's a big property and there's lots of trees. So it was a little bit woodsy by the lake shore there. And to the left of me, I notice as I'm walking, there's a tiny little cemetery. I'm thinking that's kind of weird, but I'm just going to ignore it because it's creeping me out. (laughs) Remember, this is a dream. This isn't real life. (laughs) I'm walking. And all of a sudden, I can just feel this thing following me. And my heart starts pounding and I'm going, oh, God. Stop following me. Stop following me. I don't like it. And that's when I kind of noticed that the thing following me isn't trying to catch me. It's not chasing me. And I start to pay more attention to the energy. And it's more like it's just trying to get my attention. So I muster up all my courage and I turn around and it's just this very sweet old lady smiling at me and I was relieved and she introduces herself as Helen she says hi my name is Helen my funeral is today and she does say this smiling and she says if you keep walking you'll find the church and you can go in interesting invitation but I happily accepted and I um Keep, so I keep walking, and I'm walking, and I kind of approach the field, and in the field is the church, and I walk up, and there's a gentleman standing at the top of the stairs, and he hands me a little program. I don't know if everybody around the world does that, but, you know, you get you know the list of prayers and hymns that you're singing and a little blurb about the person. So I take it, and I'm about to walk in, and I just turn to the gentleman, and I ask... Uh, him. I'm like, did she know, you know, Bruce and Dorothy, those are my, the names of my grandparents were on their property. You know, I'm like, there must be some association. And the gentleman says, yes, she, she did. And I just remember kind of looking up at the ceiling of the church and I just start to tear because, um, when I, well, when I was 15, my grandmother had passed away and she was just the sweetest. I miss her so. And um, anyways, I faded out of the dream. And I remember just waking up and I felt light and just, you know, good. But there was just this odd thought of like, who the heck is Helen? (laughs) So I immediately, I get out of bed at my parents' house, and I just dart for the garage, and I'm gonna, and I'm grabbing the newspaper. My parents are very diligent with, you know, not keeping all of the newspapers in the house stacked. It's, they're very OCD like that. So I grab the recent newspaper that's in the recycling that had just kind of gone out of date. And sure enough, I flip to the obituaries. Now it's a small town, about 5,000 people, so we're not looking extensively. And sure enough, there is an obituary, and the funeral had been, I think, the day before, and there, there it is, a woman named Helen. Her funeral was the day before, and all that jazz, and I was just kind of like, I, I, I didn't actually expect to see it, you know what I mean? And I don't know why, what possessed me, I, I just don't know, I, <laughs> and I mustered up the courage to kind of tell my mom I'm like she might think I'm crazy but she kind of goes for this kind of stuff we'll, we'll, we'll test the waters and my mom said well that's kind of interesting that you had this dream um, because there was a woman named Helen who used to work um, for your grandmother and she would clean her house and stuff like that and um, anyways by the time my parents got married um Helen no longer worked for her or whatever and there was just all these stories though that Dorothy had about Helen who did her dishes <laughs> I don't know why but um, <clears throat> and my dad had never met this woman either not really extensively so he couldn't really <clears throat> pin like he looked at the picture and he said it might be her I don't know so <clears throat> it's a, still a little bit of a mystery but it's sort of interesting too and I just I don't know. 
I just thought it was a really cool experience and very sweet. And after that, um, I used to, I, every so often, I'll have dreams about both of my grandparents. They're both um, deceased now. But I do have this one. I had this really beautiful dream where I went to their house and I took my shoes off in the mud room and I go up into the living room and there was just this tiny little Christmas tree there which was unusual for them because they always get the biggest one <laughs> and my grandparents were sitting in their designated chairs and I sat down on the couch and then boom I had that lucid moment in my dream of oh my gosh both my grandparents are deceased like there's so immediately in the dream I get up and I give them both a big hug and I tell them how much I miss them sorry and um Again, so that's just one of the really wonderful benefits of like learning how to lucid dream. And it can be very awesome. And maybe you'll even get a little visit from a loved one, whether it's purely just your brain doing it or it's spiritual. I think it's beautiful regardless. And anyway, um, happy holidays. And I hope you guys have a wonderful, wonderful day. I'm going to go get a coffee <laughs> and wipe my tears of joy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for sharing that experience like with us. Dottie. I liked her. Yeah, she was great. Dottie. But I totally get what she means by that. Like I could feel that I could feel the emotion. Like when she talked about her grandmother. Sure. But, like having those kind of dreams where you have that connection, mm -hmm. it's especially the one with Helen. That's totally random. Like yeah. I don't even know you, Helen, but yeah. it's that's cool. <clears throat> that that would happen and not be terrifying and then to have yeah i mean just getting that verification that oh my gosh yeah. what i had that experience of in that dream in fact that's one it'd be one big random coincidence but i, I you know i i don't think it was i, I think there was something to them what what a what an amazing experience! Thank you for uh, for sharing those stories with us. And even though it was very hard to get through for you, I, we really appreciate it. And Dottie, please do call in, write, and share more stories. Uh, you're a great storyteller, so we really do. I appreciate liked her. That. Yeah, love to hear from you more. Uh, that's going to wrap up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. If you like the show, help keep us on the air, become an extra podcast person. Sign up to do that over at ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. It's only $5 a month. Get access to all of our bonus episodes, archived episodes, uh, ebook, audiobook, and more. Ghostpodcast.com or patreon.com slash real ghost stories. Until next time, for Carol, I'm Tony Bruschi. Thanks for listening to Real Ghost Stories Online.